Good afternoon to all of you. First, let me begin by saying to St. Ignatius Loyola, we thank them very much for their hospitality and their courtesy in this beautiful ceremony today, especially Father Alex Witt and all the co-celebrants. Uh, on behalf of the entire Cuomo family and the grandchildren, you heard 14 grandchildren, defied all odds, 13 girls. <laughs> the boy was born just before Christmas to my brother Christopher. My brother Christopher and Christina named the boy Mario because some people will do anything to earn the praise of their father. <laughs> there is no jealousy on my part, however. We want to thank Columbia Presbyterian very much for the really fantastic care of my father during these difficult months. Dr. Engel, Dr. Mora were, were extraordinary. Uh, the health aides who took care of my father at home, um, from Steve Crockett to Dan O'Connor to Tom to Fran to Sharon, 24 hours a day, they were really magnificent. And they made his life much more pleasant uh, and also for the family. His partners at Wilkie, Farr, and Gallagher, Jack Nussbaum, he practiced law for 20 years after public service, uh, and he really enjoyed it, and it was a beautiful partnership. To his team, no administration, no government works without a team. And my father had a really fantastic team. They worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week, because that's the only way they knew how to work and Pam Broughton and Mary Tregali and Mike Del Judas and Jerry Crotty and Drew Zambelli and Tony Burgos and John Howard and John Majori, Mary Ann Crotty and my father's third son, who sometimes I think he loved the most, Joe Prococo, really did an extraordinary job and they did an extraordinary job with his funeral and we want to thank them. I want to thank uh, President Clinton for being here and Senator Clinton. Uh, they both meant so much to my father for so long, and we are all so proud, uh, not only that you're here, but that you are New Yorkers. Uh, thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you. President Obama sent remarks, Vice President Biden was here last night, Senator Gillibrand is here, Attorney General Eric Holder, U.S. Attorney Loretta Lynch, soon we hope to be Attorney General of the United States. Loretta, you make us all proud also. It's a pleasure to be with you. Mayor Bill de Blasio, who my father and I were with the other day, and my father was saying that uh, he was the first uh, political supporter for the mayor. Uh, and I said to my father, uh, well, actually, you were the second. Uh, I was technically the first because I introduced you to Bill. To which my father said, well, you were only the HUD secretary, I was the governor, that doesn't count. You know, <laughs> sometimes we could be brutally honest. Uh, Mayor Bloomberg, who my father had tremendous respect for, Mayor Dinkins, who served uh, with my father when the city and the state were in a very difficult time and they did an extraordinary job. To my colleagues from the state senate, Senator Skelos, uh, Senate Leader Skelos, uh, and so many state senators who came from around the state. I thank you very much. Uh, Speaker Sheldon Silver and the same thing. We have assembly members from all across the state, mayors, county executives from all across the state. I also thank them for their indulgence in moving the state of the state uh, a few days. It was supposed to be tomorrow, and I thank them for the personal indulgence in moving uh, the state of the state. And the literally thousands of New Yorkers who showed up uh, yesterday to pay tribute to my father at the wake. It was an amazing outpouring of support. Uh, thousands of people standing outside in the cold. My father hadn't been in public service in 20 years. Think about that, 20 years. And he had gotten very quiet after public service. But people remembered, and they remembered enough to show up 20 years later. People from all walks of life, all parts of the state, who he touched. Uh, and it was really an inspiration for all of us, and we thank them all very much for being here. One day when I was at HUD, I was talking to my father on the phone, 
and he had given a big speech that day, and I had called to ask how it went and how he did it. Did he do it from notes? Did he do it on cards? Did he do it off the cuff? And he said, oh, no, no, it was a very important speech, so he wrote it out and he read every word. And he went on to explain his theory, which he had explained before, that you can't possibly deliver a speech extemporaneously that is as well done as a written speech. He then invoked Winston Churchill as a proponent of the reading word-for-word -word theory of speech making. Now, <clears throat> you must understand the rules of engagement with, uh, in debate with Mario Cuomo. Invoking an historical figure as a source in this context was, not, was more of a metaphor than a literal interpretation. It really meant Winston Churchill could have said, or should have said, or would have said, <laughs> that reading was best. But my father's invoking the gravitas of Churchill meant that he was truly serious about this point. I explained that I was uncomfortable reading a speech word for word because I needed to see the audience's reaction and then adjust accordingly. He summarily dismissed my point, and he said that was all unnecessary. And he said, who cares about what the audience wants to hear? It's not about what they want to hear, it's about what you need to say. And that, my friends, was the essence of Mario Cuomo. He was not interested in pleasing the audience. Not in a speech, not in life. He believed what he believed and the reaction of the audience or the powers that be or the popularity of his belief was irrelevant to him. Mario Cuomo was at peace with who he was and how he saw the world. This gave him a great strength and made him anything but a typical politician. But then again, he wasn't really a politician at all. Mario Cuomo's politics were more a personal belief system. It was who he was, not what he did. In his early life, my father was never interested in politics. In general, he was disinterested in politicians in the political system. He never studied politics or joined a political club. Until his late 30s, he was all about becoming a lawyer and building a law practice. But once he became a lawyer, he became quickly bored with the typical corporate practice. Because fund fundamentally, my father was a humanist. He had strong feelings about right and wrong based on his religion, his philosophy, and his life experiences. He was very concerned with how people were treated, and that was the arena that eventually drew him in. The bridge from law to politics arrived for him when he took on the representation of the homeowners in Corona, Queens, whose homes were being condemned by the city to build a ball field. They were poor, working families, and they couldn't possibly fight City Hall. And they were going to lose everything they had, which was their home. And they were frightened, and they went to a lawyer named Mario Cuomo for help and he took on their cause to right the injustice as he saw it. The law, combined with his natural skill, empowered him to do battle, and he did. Central to understanding Mario Cuomo is the fact that Mario Cuomo was from Queens. Now, for those of you not from New York, Queens is what they call an outer borough, like Brooklyn, the Bronx, Staten Island. Interestingly, there is no borough referred to as the inner borough. <laughs> there are only outer boroughs. And that's probably the point. There are insiders and outsiders in life. And one defines the other. There are those from the other side of the tracks. There are those from the other side of town. An outer borough was where the working families lived, the tradesmen, the civil servants, the poor. Mario Cuomo was the son of Italian immigrants who were part of the great unwashed masses who came with great dreams but also came with great needs, who struggled but ultimately succeeded in this society due to the support they received in this great state of New York. Mario Cuomo's birthmark from the outer borough was deep, and he wore it with pride. 
He had a natural connection with the outsider looking in. The person fighting for inclusion, the underdog, the minority, the disenfranchised, the poor. He was always the son of an immigrant. He was always an outsider. And that was his edge. His early days in politics were not awe-inspiring. He had an early aborted run for mayor in 1973. In 1974, he lost in a Democratic primary to Marianne Krupsack. He ran for mayor in 1977, losing to Ed Koch in a truly fractious encounter. In 1978, he was elected lieutenant governor to Governor Carey. In that election, I was the campaign manager, but we had no opponents. But it, would, it, was, it was a win nonetheless. <laughs> and after that stretch, we needed one. While it is different now, historically, the job of lieutenant governor was not all that taxing. Governor David Patterson said it best when describing his role as lieutenant governor. David said he would wake up, call the governor, and if the governor answered the phone, he would go back to sleep. <laughs> My father was living in the Hotel Wellington in Albany at the time, and I started law school there, and we became roommates. The typical schedule was my father would be in Albany Monday night and Tuesday night, and he would leave on Wednesday during session months. Our third roommate was Fabian Palomino. Fabian was my, fa my father's lifelong dear friend. They'd clerked in the Court of Appeals together. Fabian came from a mixed origin. He called himself a Heinz 57, part Italian, part Native American, part African American, part anything else. He was truly a unique man. And we would have dinner together on the nights that they were in town. My mother would send up care packages, so all we had to do was heat up prepared meals. My father insisted that we sample every wine made in the state of New York, and we were soon connoisseurs of New York's best wines. Fabian, who was a portly fellow at the time, would wear a t-shirt with no sleeves, which stretched over his large belly tighter than a drumskin. He wore boxer shorts with dark dress socks over the calf. I assumed he had chronically cold calf muscles. My father, who was modest and always formal in attire, was perpetually frustrated with Fabian's dress. And he would say to Fabian, why can't you dress for dinner, Fabian? And Fabian would say, out of respect for you, I have. <laughs> he would say, I wore my fancy boxers. And then Fabian would say, I dressed out of respect for your position as lieutenant governor and the fact that you are one heart attack away from having a real job. <laughs> and Fabian would laugh, that hearty laugh, and his whole belly would shake. And my father, not loving being mocked, would smile slowly. After dinner, we would sit on the couch and we would watch television. We would watch a ball game with the news, but it didn't really matter. The function of the TV was just to introduce a topic that they could debate. And they could debate anything, an item on the news or a soap commercial. It didn't really matter. They debated to debate. They just loved it, and they were great at it. Eventually, the debate invariably, invariably turned to politics and government, and I could see my father refining, refining and honing his own personal philosophy. In 1982, my father ran against Ed Koch for governor. It was the impossible race. It couldn't be won, but my father believed he was ready and he believed he was better suited to be governor than Ed Koch because he knew the entire state and the issues of the whole state. The pollsters with their charts demonstrating the impossibility of his pursuit were unpersuasive. If my father thought he was fighting the right fight, it didn't matter whether he was going to win or lose. It was, quote unquote, the right thing to do. And there is one rule to live by, which is you always do the right thing. Mario Cuomo did not fit neatly into any political category. 
He believed that government had an affirmative obligation to help the excluded join the mainstream. He believed it was the country's founding premise and that more inclusion made the country a stronger country. Better education, better health care, economic opportunity, mobility helped the new immigrants progress and made the community stronger. Not to invest in the progress of others was a disservice to the whole. He believed in compassion for the sick and the needy. This was also the essence of Christianity and Jesus' teachings. But there were no giveaways. Responsibility and hard work was respected from all. He was not a spendthrift. He was from a culture of fiscal responsibility. He was an executive. And as a governor, he needed to balance a budget. He cut taxes and the workforce. When he took office, the top tax rate in New York was 14%. When he left office, the top tax rate was 7%. The state work workforce 12 years later was actually smaller than when he took office. Mario Cuomo intellectually was all about subtlety and nuance. He was called the great liberal. He resisted the label. His philosophy defined the single label, especially an undefined and nebulous one. My father called himself a progressive pragmatist. Progressive values, but a pragmatic approach. He believed he needed to separate the two components, the goals and the means. His goal was progressive, but his means were pragmatic. I told him at the time it was too complicated to communicate and no one would understand what he was saying. Frankly, I still don't understand what he was saying. <laughs> but he said he didn't care and that he wouldn't be reduced by the shortcomings of others, including mine. <laughs> My father was skeptical of the people in the organizations that profited from government, to whom government was a business rather than an avocation. And he always focused on the goal of government rather than the means, the product, not the process, to help the people, the student, the parent, the citizens. The truth is, he didn't love the day-to-day -day management of government. The tedium and the absurdity of the bureaucracy was mind-numbing for him. Nor did he appreciate the political back and forth and the posturing with the legislature. As governor, he was criticized by the right as the icon for the left. He was criticized by the zealots on the left because his lofty rhetoric couldn't match the program reality of his government. We commiserated. We called it the curse of the executive. No understanding or appreciation of the economic reality of needing to balance a budget or having to get the votes from a Republican Senate, no matter how pleasant a task that is, Dean. At his core, at his best, he was a philosopher, and he was a poet, and he was an advocate, and he was a crusader. Mario Cuomo was the keynote speaker for our better angels. He was there to make the case, to argue, to convince, and in that pursuit, he could be a ferocious opponent or a powerful ally, and he was beautiful. A speech never started with words. It was about the principle, the idea, and the passion, the righteousness, the injustice. And then came the words, arranged like fine pearls, each chosen for its individual beauty, but also placed perfectly, fitting just so, with the one that came before and the one that followed, so that there was a seamless flow in logic and emotion, leading one ultimately to the inevitable conclusion, which was his conclusion, which was the point of the speech in the first place. He was a religious man, and his relationship with the church was important and complicated. His famous and influential speech at Notre Dame was done more for himself, to explain how he separated his personal views from his professional responsibilities. The public official fulfilling a constitutional responsibility was different, but consistent with laymen following Christ's teachings. He believed Jesus' teachings could be reduced to one word, 
and the word was love. And love means acceptance and compassion and support to help people, to do good. And that's what he wanted government to be, a force for good. His love was not a passive love, but an act of love. Not tough love, but a strong love. The good fight was a fight for love, and it was a fight he was ready to wage. In many ways, my father's view on the church was ahead of its time. He was excited about our new Pope Francis and his enlightened perspective on Catholicism with an emphasis on inclusion and understanding. My father thought that Pope Francis would agree that Jesus himself was probably from an outer borough. <laughs> As you heard from Father Witt, my father loved Théard de Chardin, a French Jesuit who modeled service and a dedication to sustainable community as a way of life. My father was a Lincoln scholar, attracted by Lincoln's example of government as the pursuit of great principles. He also appreciated that Lincoln was the triumph of substance over style and that his life exemplified the relative isolation of people in power. We were a working class family, and we were proud of it. No fancy trips, no country clubs for us. He was the working man's governor, and he remained loyal to the old neighborhood values always. His children, his grandchildren, my children, will speak of grandpa's sweetness my father always had a sweetness, but it grew over the years, much as a fine wine turns into a brandy. I, however, remember his younger years, and sweetness is not the first word that would come to mind. <laughs> Make no mistake, Mario Cuomo was a tenacious, competitive, incredibly strong man. He was impatient with the bureaucracy, unrelenting in the face of bigotry, uncompromising in remedying injustice. And he was really, really, really tough. It would have been malpractice not to be. These battles were for real consequences and made a difference to real people. And he was also competitive by nature. Whether in a campaign, fighting the legislature on a basketball court, you opposed him at your own risk and peril. And I have the scars to prove it. The basketball court remained for him the one place where he could allow himself to be his fully aggressive self. Governors, you see, are supposed to comport themselves with a certain dignity and decorum. And my father took that very seriously. He always tried to be elegant and a statesman. But the basketball court was the one exception, and it was his liberation. We had epic battles, he and I. He hated few things as much as a timid opponent on the basketball court because you cheated him of a real contest. I was bigger than my father, and I was not intimidated by the fact that he was governor. He couldn't fire me. We played in the state police gym in Albany. He liked to play one-on-one -on -one because it was the purest form of competition. He was a solid 240 pounds and fast for a big man. He would make faces at you, he would taunt you, he would talk constantly in a distracting and maddening banter designed to unnerve you. He would hit you in places the human body did not have anatomical defenses. The issue of calling fouls plagued us. We tried using state troopers as referees, but they were afraid of angering my father, that with one wrong call, they would weigh up, wind up in a way station somewhere up on the north way. We tried selecting troopers that he didn't know, so they could be anonymous, and then there could be no fear of retaliation. But the troopers also wanted to be able to wear a gun after one was attacked by my father or myself, I can't recall which now, for making a bad call. After I left Albany, the basketball competition became more institutionalized. My father 
started a basketball league with a number of teams. They had professional referees, and any referee disputes would be settled by the league commissioner. And my father served as the league commissioner. <laughs> At the end of the season, there would be draft selections depending on the results. Some people accused my father of hiring state employees only for their basketball talents. He denied that it ever happened. Well, at least let's say it didn't happen often. Basketball was my father's outlet and it was always in good humor and always with good sportsmanship, at least by the next day. My father loved to battle the press. They were like the opposing counsel in a courtroom. He thought if they could judge his actions and communicate that to the public, then he had a right to challenge their facts and their judgment. He was unmoved by his staff's passionate arguments that this was counterproductive. You don't fight with people who buy ink by the barrel, as the old saying goes. My father was undeterred. The crusade was too important to tolerate sloppiness or misinterpretation. The public deserved the truth, and the press did not have the right to distort it, certainly not with impunity. He railed against the ivory tower pundits, the reporters with an agenda. He had no problem calling a reporter at 7 a.m. to give them a critique of their article. Most often, fair to say, the critique was not overly positive. I have evolved, and I would never call a reporter at 7 a.m. I wait until at least 9 a.m., which I think is decent. But he also, he also admired journalism done well, and he respected the occupation. Jimmy Breslin and Pete Hamill and Jack Newfield and Murray Kempton and Mary McGrory and Mike Lupica and Mike Barnacle, Marsha Kramer, Gabe Pressman, all profound crusaders for justice. He was humbled to be in public service and had disdain for those who demeaned it with scandals or corruption or cheap public relations stunts. It was a position of trust and it deserved to be honored. Mario Cuomo served 12 years with integrity. You could disagree with Mario Cuomo over those years, but he never dishonored the state and he never dishonored his position. In his private life, he was exactly as he appeared in his public life. He had a 60-year love affair with his wife, Matilda, and it was beautiful to watch. This was not a phony made-for-TV romance, no late-night kissing in the park, at least as far as we knew, but a real-life partnership built on respect and love and tolerance. Commitment to Mario Cuomo was sacrosanct. His children were everything to him. Although I look the oldest, Margaret is actually the oldest and a source of great pride. He beamed when he would say, my daughter, the doctor. Maria, his artistic, altruistic delight. With Maria, he probably had the purest loving relationship. Madeline made him proud as a great mother and a tenacious attorney. Chris, talented, facile, and funny, could always make him laugh. He loved his daughters-in-law, Sandy and Christina, and, in, and his son-in-laws, with whom he had a really special relationship, Kenneth and Howard and Brian. They enjoyed a true father and son relationship. It was mutual, and they were adored. He had a small group of friends, Nick D'Arienzo, his friends since college, Jimmy Breslin, Vince Teasy, Mike Del Judas, Sandy Frusher, Joe Percoco, Fabian Palomino were his intimate world. Over the years, the press would love to give their dime store psychoanalysis of our quote-unquote complex father and son relationship, which was all a lot of hooey. And this, it is this simple. I was devoted to my father from the time I was 15, joining him in every crusade. My dad was my hero. He was my best friend. He was my confident, confidant and my mentor. We spoke almost every day, and his wisdom grew as I grew older. 
When it works, having a working partnership with your father adds an entirely new dimension to the father-son relationship. And for us, it worked. Politics is not an easy business. It shouldn't be. But we carried the same banner. I helped him become a success, and help, he helped me become a success, and we enjoyed deeply each other's victories. And we suffered the pain of each other's losses. My only regret is that I didn't return from Washington to help, to help in his 1994 race. Whether or not I could have helped, I should have been there. It was the right thing to do, and I didn't do it. I loved winning the governorship more for him than for myself. It was redemption for my father. Cuomo was elected governor. The first name was not all that relevant. It was a gift to have him with us this past election night. The doctors didn't want him to go, but I insisted. Bringing him on the stage for one more fist pump. Holding up his hand, I could feel his energy surge. His face brightened, his eyes shined as he gave us that great satisfied smile one more time. He walked off the stage and said, wow, what a crowd that was. It was the best medicine I could provide for Mario Cuomo. He loved being governor, and he thought that he could do four terms, and he valued that over anything else. He wouldn't trade six more years as governor even for the Supreme Court. Why didn't he run for president, people ask? Because he didn't want to. That's all. But that's everything to Mario Cuomo. He was where he thought God wanted him to be. He was a man of principle, of honor, of duty, of service, and that defined his life. He had simple tastes, no expensive cars, no planes, no fancy homes. A weekend meal with family, watching a baseball or basketball game with my father's running commentary, reading a good book or just talking, but really talking. There was no small talk or superficiality with Mario Cuomo. My father never lost his interest in public affairs. We would talk at 5 a.m. and he would have read all the newspapers and had his full analysis ready and was ready to tell me everything I did wrong the day before. We would talk about the problems and try to find a way through the maze. He was recently very troubled with what he called the mess in Washington. He was concerned about our city. My father's 1984 speech was called The Tale of Two Cities, and he was adamant about pointing out inequities in our society and the division in our society. But the goal was always to unify, never to divide. And the current factions in New York City were very concerning to him. He governed during Howard Beach and Bensonhurst. And he knew the racial and class divisions are the New York City fault lines. They say your father never leaves you. If you listen carefully, you will hear his voice. I believe that's true. But one doesn't need to listen that carefully or be his son to know what Mario Cuomo would say today, that it's time for this city to come together. It's time to stop the negative energy and to move forward. That the intelligent course, the constructive course, the responsible course is to learn the lessons from the past tragedies, to identify the necessary reforms, to improve our justice system, to have better safety measures for police officers, and to move this city forward. And that's just what we will do. I promise you that, Pop. For Mario Cuomo, the purpose of life was clear, to help those in need and leave the world a better place. Matthew 25 in Christianity, Tikkun Olam in Judaism, to heal the divide, Sadaka, to do justice, it's that simple, and yet it's that profound. It's that easy, and yet it's that hard. By any measure, Mario Cuomo's voice inspired generations. His government initiatives helped millions live better lives. He left the world a better place than he found it. 
his list of accomplishments goes on and on, leading opponent of the death penalty, appointing the first African-American and Hispanic judge to the Court of Appeals, the first two females, his Liberty Scholarship programs, his pioneering ch child health insurance program, leader in AIDS treatment and research. New York is a better state, thanks to Mario Cuomo. The last few days he was slipping, and I said to him, to give him something to look forward to, that he needed to stay strong for the inaugural, because I wanted him to hold the Bible. And he asked in his semi-conscious state, which Bible, which only Mario Cuomo would ask. And I said, the King James Bible, unless you want a different one. And he said, no, King James would be okay for this purpose. I didn't follow up. <laughs> a few days later, he said to me that it was too weak to hold the Bible, but that he would be here, he said. He would be here. The day of the inauguration, I stopped at his apartment. I went to his bed. And I said, Dad, the inauguration is today. Do you want to come? You can hold the Bible, or you don't have to hold the Bible. And there was no response. I said, well, let me know, because there's a second event in Buffalo this afternoon. And it starts at 4 o'clock, and if you change your mind, you can come to Buffalo. During that afternoon, my sister played my inaugural speech for him. He knew that the Buffalo event was at 4 o'clock. My father passed away at 5.15. He was here. He waited. And then he quietly slipped out of the event and he went home, just like he always did because his job was done. We believe the Spirit lives, and I believe my father is not gone and that the Spirit is with us. It's in Amanda's song, it's in Michaela's charisma, it's in Tessa's dance, it's in Christopher's laugh, and it's in every good deed I do. I believe my father's spirit lives in the hope of a young boy sitting in a failing public school who can't yet speak the language. His spirit lives in a young girl, pregnant and alone and in trouble. His spirit lives in the South Bronx, and it lives in South Jamaica. His spirit lives in all those outsiders, still living in the shadow of opportunity, and still striving for their chance to join the family of New York. And Pop, you were right once again, and I was wrong. Tell Winston Churchill I now agree. I read every line, Pop, word for word because it's not about what they want to hear. It's about what I wanted to say. And I said it. Pop, tell Officer Ramos and Officer Lou we missed them already. Tell Fabian and Mike McAlary and Jack Newfield and Grandma and Grandpa and Uncle Frank we love them. And Pop, a day will not go by that I don't miss your smile and your strength. I will listen for your voice. Pop, you taught us well. You inspired us. We know what we have to do, and we will do it. We will make this state a better state, and we will do it together. On that, you have my word as your son. I love you, Pop, and I always will. Thank you.